Take the middle one. Interesting, you took the middle one. There you go. <laughs> you may <laughs> wish to um, bring one of the microphones closer to you. I think I can project well enough to get to the other end of the table. Oh, Johnny, good. Okay. Um, um, look, my minute's very much in your hands. Okay, answer. I should just read what I've written here. Yeah, I, I wasn't please. anticipating a small group, I thought I was going to be lecturing to a bigger group, but here we go. Um, good afternoon, my name is John Jukes, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I am a recently retired dentist. I graduated in 1973, being awarded the Royal Society of Periodontology Prize. In 1975 I was awarded the Hunter Scholarship for Postgraduate Study. I have practiced in three countries. My last 34 years of practice were in Waipukuro, Central Hawke's Bay. When I arrived in Waipukuro, the town's water supply was fluoridated. I have been practicing for 34 years in a catchment of 12,000, of which 4,000 were fluoridated between 1979 and 2012. Early on, I was observing fluorosis in some of the children's teeth. I reported this to the area dental officer and was told to keep it quiet. That stimulated me to study the subject. So after 34 years of studying the research and observing the population of Central Hawke's Bay and Waikukuro, I conclude it is not a good idea. The product used, hydrofluorosilicic acid, is very toxic. It's not a nutrient. Most of it goes down the drain and into the local <coughs> rivers and harbours. 700 tonnes a year goes into Auckland's harbour. At the moment we're trying to clean up our harbours and rivers, adding toxic chemicals is a not a move in the right direction. Pharmacologically, it is a nonsense. Concentration in a water supply is not controlled dosage. The dose one gets depends upon how much one drinks, how much one showers or bathes, how much one waters the vegetable garden. Fluoridation of a water supply is an attempt at treating a symptom, a symptom of excess consumption of refined sugar. It is best to treat the cause, excess sugar. The child with excess sugar consumption will not have the disease resolved by fluoridating a water supply. These kids tend not to drink the water, but drink lolly water, now abbreviated SSBs, sugar sweetened beverages. I believe a better approach is education and motivation. Scotland's Child Smile Programme, which is summarised here, shows that this is works, that this works. Therefore, I do not support any bill supporting the promotion of fluoridating water supply. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, Sarah, can I ask you a question? Not yourself, not um, I really appreciate everything you had to say, especially about the um, fluoride not treating the actual symptom, and um, I'm a big fan of a sugary drinks tax that could then raise revenue, which could promote better health and kind of discourage overconsumption of sugary drinks, especially amongst the poorest people who are the most affected at the moment. But um, I'm just curious, because through your professional experience, you came to the conclusion that fluoride wasn't necessary. Um, I mean, why is it that the New Zealand Dental Association do you think supports um, fluoridation? Um, I think it's a faith concept and it relates to the way it was presented. Um, if I can go back historically, when I was at dental school they presented in the argument for fluoridated water supplies, three things. One was that it was going to reduce tooth decay by 75%. Well, that's proved to be rubbish. Secondly, that they were going to put sodium fluoride in the water supply. That turned out to be not true either. Okay. The third thing was that the, uh, that the fluoride ion replaces a hydroxyl radical in the, in, the, in the appetite crystal. That's true, and that reduces the uh, solubility in acid. But of course, it not only affects teeth, it affects bones, it affects the pineal gland, it influences the thyroid function, that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I think that when it was presented at dental school to us guys, I went away believing it, um, as did all the rest of my classmates. Um, and it was only, and I was still giving my children fluoride tablets until I arrived in Waikukuro, and it was only through seeing the fluorosis that, that encouraged me to study it, and then in the process of studying it that I come to realise um, that it's not as good as, as but we were believing, yeah. Fluorosis is mainly a cosmetic issue and it usually doesn't happen now, right? Because they have reduced the amount of fluoride. Mm -hmm. Fluorosis, as you might say, is your first sign of toxicity. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if it's um, showing up in, in, in the teeth, then it's obviously um, modifying what's going on with bones and obviously other things that can be influencing, which we don't test for, don't examine for. We don't, we don't run epidemics um, 
epidemiological studies, looking at thyroid function in fluoridated areas, all these little sort of side of things. We're, we're not following up. We were sold the idea that it was a good idea. It was presented to us at dental school, um, where you have to agree with what's presented with you to pass the exams, okay? And we get on with general practice, generally speaking, and, and, and don't study it. Um, so there's only a few of us who have taken the time to study it. Well, I thought there had been quite a large number of. Peer, I thought there had been quite a large number of peer-reviewed studies around the world about the impacts of fluoride, and as you say, um, some of that's natural water fluoridation in parts of the world. So we're not adding anything to it. You speak of. Sorry, uh, am I interrupting you? Uh, well, I'm just saying I, I thought there was quite a large number of peer-reviewed studies which have, which have been done over decades, which don't show any reason to believe that there's adverse health effects. Uh, there are there are lots of studies. That, well, there are studies done. Um, you've only got about three countries in the world doing this fluoridating. Okay, you've got America doing it, New Zealand, um, Australia, and a little bit of the British Isles. I think I'm correct there. Correct me wrong if I'm wrong. There's only about three places in other three countries doing it. Okay, so therefore, there's but not, isn't yeah. that because there are, there is natural fluoridation, water fluoridation in many parts of Europe? Like natural, it's naturally occurring in the water, and that's why. No, and that varies too. Because there was a big um, study just done in Sweden which looked at natural fluoridation in the water and uh, found that there was a benefit to parts of, parts of the country that naturally had naturally occurring fluoride as opposed to those that had lower naturally occurring fluoride. But it's all about the dose, right? I mean, there's too much, there's too little, and there's the right amount to get benefit for um, protecting too. My personal view is here, if, if the material is not a nutrient, it's toxic. Um, it's, it's, it, I mean, define the right dose of lead. We took lead out of the petrol, okay? Yeah. Um, so we don't say, oh, yeah, here's a safe dose of lead, and here you're okay with this amount of lead, not right. the right amount of lead. I mean, the, the fluoride thing is exceptionally toxic. Um, and not only is, is, if you But is it toxic if it's naturally occurring, or is it yeah, only toxic? Yeah, it's, it's the same right? stuff. It's the same stuff. So you stuff. think we should, in plain parts of the world, they should probably, that, that they're having ill effects of naturally occurring fluoride because it's toxic? Yes. Right. If I heard your question, you say, are there parts of the world where you've got ill effects through natural, naturally occurring fluoride? Is that what yeah. you ask? Yeah, there is. Um, once yeah, again, you have, to, you have to ask the question, what is, what's naturally and where is this natural uh, levels occurring? Like, for example, with the big uh, Ruapehu eruption um, not so long ago, well, in my life not so long ago, of Ruapehu, and, and Central Hawks Bay got dusted with volcanic dust, so that when you put your windows up and down in your car, it screws because the amount of dust that was there, that sort of stuff. The fluoride level goes up at that point, okay, that brings a lot of, a lot of fluoride in. If you measure um, fluoride levels in parts of India, you'll find it's quite high, but then you take a closer look up the river a little bit, and you'll find it's a big industrial area going on up there. So there's uh, lots of factors coming to influence the, what the concentration Sorry, I do, of fluoride I do. is. I mean, unfortunately, this is all completely irrelevant to the bill because the bill is about who's making the decisions, and not it's not Parliament making the decision about mandatory fluoridation. It's about whether or not, at the moment, some councils choose to fluoridate their water, and uh, this bill is proposing that that decision shifts to district health boards as they'd be more able to evaluate the evidence of both health benefits or disbenefits. And costs. I, I don't think they are more capable of doing that. You well, why would you, why would you think that they would have to be part of Oh, well, it's just most of the people who work for city councils are planners and engineers and people who deal with infrastructure, and yeah. they, don't, they don't actually deal with health. Yeah. So this bill says nothing about whether or not it would be, uh, you know, putting in fluoride or taking fluoride out or making a decision to change it. I mean, obviously, the district health board could make a decision possibly to recommend against fluoridation where there is fluoride currently. I mean, that, that's the way this bill works. It's about who makes the decision and district health boards being locally elected and also being charged with you know, medical and health issues are in a better position to evaluate all the evidence, as you say, than city councils who are primarily dealing with infrastructure and planning. Um, we could maybe move this debate a little bit. But first of all, just to sum up my I just want to clarify what the bill was about, because yeah, I mean, yeah, there seems yeah, to be a yeah, misconception yeah. that the bill says anything about um, whether or not there will be fluoridation, because it doesn't. By no, doing, no, it literally doesn't. Uh, you probably don't need me to point this out okay. to you, but by shifting to the DHB one, you've taken a little bit further away from the, the democratic process. Okay. Well, DHBs are locally elected. That's right, and that doesn't make them experts on fluoride. Uh, well, the same, so that would be the same as city councillors. I mean, both of them. That's are right. Elected. That's right. Yeah, they don't have the knowledge to make these decisions. Do we have we have a methods. Pardon? Do dentists? Then? 
Um, no, only if they've stopped to study it. If they've just simply left dental school and gone away with told it was a good idea, therefore I believe it. They, they, they're not toxicologists, they're just dentists that would believe what they've told. The person who takes the time to study the subject, I think it's worth, maybe worth giving the time to listen to a little bit more. Um, but the medical ethic of, of um, informed consent comes to play here too, if, if we're not brought this, the, the discussion a little bit too far here. And once you once you take it away from the from the, from the individual, then you, you you haven't got. Well, it's not with the individual at the moment. Um, at the moment, elected councillors make Great. a decision Great. that fifty percent of New Zealanders are already living in areas with fluoridated water supplies. Correct. And now the question is: Should it is it appropriate for city councils to make that decision, or is it more appropriate for locally elected district health boards to make the decision, given that it's a health Either way, it's a health issue and it requires analysis of health-based evidence, which in any other area, city councils don't deal with anything. Yeah. You seem to be discussing two points. One, is it bad or is it worse? Um, I, don't think oh, no, it, just, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea, full stop. Oh, so it's the, it's the district council. city councils should make this No, I don't think it should anymore. be happening at all. I thought that might have been obvious by what I've just said. I what think I'm hearing my colleague correctly, it, it seems it is twofold. Absolutely, your point's taken in terms of just don't do it all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's a, I think the next question, I suppose, within the scope of the bill per se is who should be making the decisions? Yeah. So if I'm The short the answer is no one. Okay. The individual. The individual should be making the decision. And this here, this, this is the Scotland's um, Child Smile right. Program. So it shows that you can get better results with education and motivation than you can with fluoridating a water supply. So, fortunately, we've yeah, gone. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you comfortable leaving a copy of that document with us? Or yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, yes. If you're only copy, we can just reference it as well. We'll we'll get one for all of you. So, thank you very much. Thank you.